Schultz is our yeah. guest here on the program. He was here almost exactly one month ago to the day on this program, advising people to conserve water. And then right after he came on the show, raindrops began falling and didn't stop for quite some time. Jim, good morning. Belly on up to the microphone and say hello to everybody. Good morning, Rob. How are you? Excellent. Thank you very much. So uh, did we get enough rain to release a bit of your stress level? Yes, uh, that's a good point. When I was here last time, it was 100 degrees, and we hadn't had rain for some time. So mm -hmm. thankfully, uh, we did receive that inventory of some water supply, and the grass has turned green, and everybody's mowing their lawn uh, every week. Uh, so superficially, uh, we did have a nice uh, uh, supply of rain come down and, and reduce the demand on the water supply for that period of time. And we're getting by fairly well right now. Uh, the spring that we spoke of previously that's down in the, in the Inwood area, that is a big portion of our supply, that's uh, subjected to the groundwater, and that doesn't get replenished unless there's substantial rain over a long period of time. So we're, we're easing that along, and what we've mm -hmm. been able to do is, because of our good friends at the city of Martinsburg, we've been buying a little extra water from them, <clears throat> and we've created a situation where... We've put in a pumping system that we can leapfrog, if you will, water from the industrial zone, which is down by uh, a table station, right. and move that further south into the Inwood area, which is where we need the supply. So fortunately, some good planning has allowed us to get by this year. We're in good shape for right now. We're still asking people to use water very wisely. Fortunately, I think we're going to get some rain uh, tomorrow night, and it's going to get cold. So let's say the growing season is coming to a close. So that's good news. Hopefully, we'll have a good winter this year with a lot of snow, a uh, good spring with some rain, replenish the spring so that we head into next year with a full complement of inventory and be able to get through another year. Until we can get other infrastructure in place, last time I was here, we spoke about how we got plans to increase the size of the river plant from 6 million gallons a day to 10 million gallons a day. It's been such a struggle to get the regulatory agencies to get everything in line so we can move forward with this. I believe we're going to get a call next week that we're going to finally have the go-ahead to get out to bid on that very important component, and hopefully things will be moving forward. So as uh, demand continues to grow in our community, we'll be able to have the capacity to meet that demand by this new infrastructure we're putting together. So would, at this time, it be a concern for you if you saw somebody, let's say, in the south end of the county watering their lawn? No, I mean, we're asking people not to, but we're getting by, and because there's not much of a need, if somebody put down some sod, uh, you know, it's not the end of the world right now. And once again, we're going to get some rain tomorrow, and it's going to get cold, so there's not going to be as much of a need to keep uh, a substantial amount of water from the water system on the ground. So we're okay. You need to use some water for shrubs and, and lawn. That's okay. I understood we were down about 10 inches of rain last time we spoke. Is that yeah. figure close? I actually got some information yesterday. We're, uh, we're down seven and a half inches for the year right now. Mm -hmm. And one little nugget of wisdom is that uh, we're in the, the fifth driest year in the last 129 years, which is surprising since it doesn't feel that bad. Right. But apparently uh, it's just kind of an anomaly this year. And it's kind of been limited to our geographical area. You look at the rest of the state of West Virginia, they've been getting plenty of rain. It's just this little corridor around Route 81, and so it's affected a lot of the stream flow uh, in, you know, the Tuscarora the stream and the, and the Mill Creek are kind of low relative to where they would normally be this time of year. As you pump water from the city toward the southern end of the county, how do people access that water supply? Well, it's within our infrastructure, our distribution system. We're just taking it from where... Normally, it wouldn't flow because of the hydraulic grades. We're, we're higher down in the southern end of the, of the county. So we put some pumps in, and we're pumping in a, such a way where we bypass a valve so that we can take water that we have and put it into an area where there's less of it. So it's, it's just a mechanical pump that allows us to push water further south. Is there public water and sewer in the south end of the county? Oh, sure. Is that, and that's how it's accessed, is, I guess, is my question. It's just that they get it from that water supply. Yes, all right. Yes. So, but if you had a well, that wouldn't be water you'd be able to tap into, correct? If if somebody has a well, yeah. Well, they they can. That's on, their, their water supply. They can do whatever they wish. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we wouldn't be involved in that. Right. 
So, so that's my actually going to be my question, Rob. When when we talk about water shortages and cutting back and what have you, um, I have a well. It's three hundred feet deep. It's thirty gallons a minute. Is that when we have water shortages, we go without rain for a long time? Do people on wells like me have have concerns about watering their grass or such, or is that just something we? don't that's for city folk oh no it's it's a concern obviously each well might be a little different its characteristics mm-hmm. and where it gets recharged from but think of it this way if it doesn't fall through the sky end up in a stream and, and permeate through the ground eventually it's not going to get in your well so over time if you're taking out more than being that's being replenished you will have a net loss of capacity which then comes up, and I, I hate to ask this because I think it, it might end up in the open if it's, if it's too stupid, but it seems to me that water is the ultimate recyclable product. So if I water my lawn, and even a, in the dry times, I water my lawn, that water evaporates, it goes up, con- condenses, and then comes down again, right? So where is the loss? We hear about this in California and these places in, in times of drought. Where does the water go? I mean, why does it, it it recycles? So why doesn't it come back? Well, that's an interesting question. And a lot of times when I spend talking to school children or something, this is an interesting <laughs> thing. The same water that was here when the dinosaurs uh, graced the face of the planet is the same water you're consuming today. Think of the Earth as a closed container. Right. Water doesn't come or go. It's here. It just changes form. It'll go from, let's start with the clouds, and it falls down, and it ends up either, it it, it never goes away, it just changes form. It can go into the ground, it can evaporate back into the atmosphere. It all ends up in the ocean, right? Every drop of water will theoretically run to the ocean, and then it gets evaporated again, becomes clouds, and then the cycle just repeats itself perpetually. So you're right. There's a limited supply of water within the planet Earth, It just changes form, and its location can be changed by the process of uh, transpiration, evaporation, and moving from one place to the other. Hence the reason why at times you have a a deluge of rain in one area and another area is dry. It's all within the earth, but it's just changing where it is at that moment in time. So sometimes you can be the beneficiary. Other times you can be the, the one who's... Lacking so that <clears throat> so when I when when I water my lawn at times I shouldn't water my lawn it comes back down but it, it's just not going to be in my yard anymore it's going to be in Colorado or it could take ten million France. years <laughs> right, right right it could by the time that little drop of water uh-huh. comes back it could have been consumed in India it could have ended up in Russia it could have ended up in frozen lakes somewhere in the Antarctic and then eventually it's all the same water but you're not going to get that particular little water back anytime soon all right but it's an interesting question people don't realize it that we are a closed container the planet earth the only thing that comes and goes is sunlight everything else is here or was here or will always be here it just changes the manner and the form in which it exists same amount of water that's what you're saying the same amount of water that was yeah. here from the beginning of time is here today it just, once again, it's it's changing its form. Mr. Harvey. Talking about the radon and the, the prevalence of limestone, th- doesn't that also um, have the, the benefit of acting as a filter and purifying water? So if, like say John has a well, he may be, have better quality water because of the, the limestone? Well, quality I, it, it adds hardness to the water that's what it yeah, sure does yeah, yeah, that's what <laughs> oh, yeah. no, it's it's calcium bad. carbonate and uh so that's why the um i mean the water we get out of that spring that i spoke of earlier down in the south end of the county is very hard because the water just you know runs through the limestone and accumulates that calcium and then it's in the water that's why being in the water softening business around here is very uh, productive so is with the growth in berkeley county is there enough capacity coming off the Potomac and other places to sustain the growth? The one good thing we, we have in this community, which will be beneficial for many, many, for the end of time, is that we do have the Potomac River. That is the one sustainable, drought-resistant source of supply. And that is the reason why we're, that we're focusing primarily on that 
as we're expanding the capacity of the plant up there, our challenge is to have that capacity to treat the water out of the river and then to be able to convey it to where it's needed, which requires pumps and pipes and, and, and tanks, which we're working on to keep the water out into the system. So we're fortunate because we do have the river. It just needs to have the infrastructure to utilize that river and get the water to where it needs to be. Are we past the concerns that Maryland owns the river? Yes, um, as I understand it, there was a, a legal uh, decision rendered some time ago, could be two decades by now, that the state of West Virginia has access to as much water as they desire. So we have no restrictions on the volume of water that we withdraw from that river, thankfully. I thought that was during <clears throat> Attorney General Morrissey's tenure when uh, he went to court to battle Maryland about that. So I, I think, I, at least it seems that sounds familiar. That sounds correct, Rob. Yeah. Why, you mentioned the Potomac River is drought resistant. Why is that? Well, it has a huge watershed. So there's, uh, when it does rain, there is a lot of volume of water that ends up into, down into Washington, D.C., where it finally discharges into the Chesapeake Bay and into the ocean. And there's also a reservoir that was constructed, uh, the Jennings, uh, Jennings Randolph. Jennings Randolph. Jennings Randolph. Yeah. And that was a fortune because that is a – a reserve, a reservoir of water that is available to be released in the event that the uh, river's flow drops below a certain point. And it'll always be released because, remember, we get the water before they get it in Washington, D.C., which they use for their water supply. So I think we can be confident that if there's a need, the water will be allowed to be released so the people in Washington can have an adequate supply of water. Do we actively discharge any water back into the Potomac? Well, all of our wastewater plants kind of gets back to what was asked earlier. Everything, when we use water, we then collect water through our wastewater system, collection system. We treat it, and then we discharge it back in. We do recycle it in theory, right, through the natural progression. So we'll take it out. It'll go through the, we'll distribute it. People will use it. If you're on the sewer system, it goes back into the sewer system, goes back to the wastewater treatment plant, and gets put right back into the Potomac River. And just like it's done upstream before it gets here, I would presume. Exactly. So, in, in theory, you know, when uh, Cumberland, Maryland discharges their treated wastewater into the Potomac River, and then eventually it gets here, we take it out, treat it for water supply, put it back into the wastewater collection system, they treat it again, and then this perpetual, continuous recycling of the water supply uh, until it gets back in the ocean, and then it naturally goes through that cycle again where it goes into the air and returns many, many days later, you know, millions of years later, back into the Potomac River. If you think about it long enough, you'd never drink water again. Uh, or, or <laughs> John's going to sell his jet skis. <laughs> he's not going to go back out on the river anymore. Uh, that's so, very true. People don't realize it, but you're drinking what somebody else didn't want at yeah. one point in time. Right. So, which brings us, there's a lot of farming in the area, and, and animals all do what animals do by way of their own recycling, right? Mm -hmm. So, how deep does, does a well... At 100 feet, is, does a well have to worry about old hay, you know, the, the bacteria from, from cow poop and other things getting into the water supply? Well, that's pretty much specific to the characteristics of the soils in the immediate area. I mean, if it had a direct channel because there was some uh, opening in karst, let's say, because mm -hmm. there was nothing to filter the water before it got into a, a conduit, which went right down into the well, then you could have a well that is, um, you know, contaminated with bacteria of undesirable nature, things of that. Uh, so it's specific to the ability of the, the earth has this remarkable ability to cleanse itself. It just takes time, and it takes the right characteristics. And that's what we as, uh, you know, we, we artificially create those same in, environment to cleanse the water that would normally occur in nature, but we don't have the time for that to happen before it gets polluted. So in that case, yeah, this concerns it. It's not a bad idea to have your well tested periodically uh, for bacteria concerns. Jim Millet is about, our guest here on the program. He's the executive director of the Berkeley County Public uh, Service Water District. Go ahead, Matt. Just think about like pharmaceutical drugs that are put in, are flushed or discarded. Is that is that an issue? And is that in, on the treatment side? It, it's been brought into the public water concern where they have uh, we have now have the ability to measure contaminants in parts per trillion, 
Oh, wow. Which is equivalent to one inch in 16 million miles. How do you put that in your mind, how you can measure something? But since we can, we do. And since we now have answers, we see this effects of, of uh, people, you know, prescriptions either going through our body and ended up into the wastewater system, which then gets through the wastewater plant, which then gets back into the river. But because we can measure in such small amounts, it's, it's not a concern as far as we have to do something today, but it's one of those things that's being monitored in the regulatory world and uh, evaluating whether or not there is some treatment that we may need to be a part of our world someday to remove it before we put it back into the drinking water <coughs> supply. I was in the hazardous waste business in the early days of the hazardous waste business in the 1980s, and the old saw was the solution to pollution is dilution. So, you know, you just <laughs> you pour enough water into the toxin, and you get little enough toxin that it's, it's not a concern right. anymore. The laws have evolved since then. Uh, but I do think the more we measure, this is a concern of mine, actually, the more we can measure stuff down to parts per trillion, because people don't understand that there are permissible exposure limits to all of these, oh, my God, there's a, a, a trillionth of a particle of something poisonous, we have to shut down the water supply. And uh, so there's a PR issue that's involved with a lot of, of these. Oh, no question. If, if you know, regulators have a job, they regulate. If there's nothing to regulate, they're out of business. Mm -hmm. So they constantly come up with new things. And we, if you always have to think, what is the cost and what is the value? <clears throat> well, we won't head off into economics here, but there's every time we have to do more to treat the water to a certain level, it comes with a cost. And if, if we realize that when we're paying more for water than we want to, then that's that much money we have less for something else. So how do you determine the greatest return on your investment? And uh, we're getting to the point when we, parts per trillion, we're treating the water. But think about it. 99% of the water we probably treat and produce and deliver of such high quality, and, and especially with respect to public health, ends up back in the toilet or in the drain. So we're going through this extreme to have this beautiful water, the vast majority of which never gets consumed. Just a thought that uh, hasn't really been considered in the, uh, in the regulatory world to think about it that way. Do we have concern? It was the last couple of years, it was a Detroit that had the outrageous yes. lead levels in, in their water. We have cities- The Flint uh, River, yeah. That are as old as Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, to your knowledge in, in this part of the world, are, those, are there concerns like that? Well, that was a specific case in which uh, the, the they had modified a treatment practice without evaluating the secondary effects of that. And so you had, lead doesn't come in water, but lead is in piping. It's in, especially the older homes. Uh, and if you have the right conditions, like anything, water is a universal solvent. If it's exposed to lead long enough, it will the lead will leach out into the water and then you measure it and it's in the water. So what they did in Flint, they modified a treatment practice which was intended to prevent or minimize the amount of water or lead that could leach from the pipes into the water. And then, uh, so it was more of an operational failure as opposed to a significant water quality issue. It, it didn't have to happen. Mm -hmm. and But because of it, there's tremendous secondary effects that the regulatory agency introduced into the world. And now we are all doing more and more with respect to lead and copper compliance. And like in our system, you know, the oldest pipes we have are back in the late 1950s. We don't have lead in our system. We don't have copper in our system to speak of. But yet we have to go through a tremendous amount of regulatory activities in order to comply with regulations that were just designed to be an umbrella application. And so we're spending a lot of money for something that we know we don't even have. But that's, that's part of the world so, of regulations. Sounds like a waste of money. You, uh, you've said that yeah. well. Jim, final minute here. Uh, any uh, final thoughts for our audience in regard to water supply over the fall? No, thank you for those who, uh, who have uh, gotten us through this time by uh, using water wisely. Um, the good news is we're just about to a point where we're going to go out to bid for some uh, large construction projects. We got $130 million worth of infrastructure we're about to commence, all with the objective of having enough water and uh, ability to provide whoever desires it throughout our community thank you for coming by sir thank you Rob. and solve this trivia question let one tea or two uh just one in my case i like to keep it nice and sweet just one tea. <laughs> very good hey thanks for coming in jim thanks.